Welcome to Cave Springs. It's an area near Beamsville, Ontario that has more tall tales associated with it than any other one I've ever heard of. And my concern is that these tales are slowly being forgotten. And this video is meant to help correct some of that. But before we begin, I need to acknowledge the late William F. Ranney, who literally wrote the book on this place, published in the 1980s. It's a collection of the history and stories associated with Cave Springs. And it has been an invaluable resource in the creation of this video. Oh, and it may help if you can imagine that you're hearing these tales when they were originally told, which in some cases was hundreds of years ago. It would have been a time when word of mouth was the main way these stories were shared, which I suppose makes it kind of the historical equivalent to Twitter today. And then sometimes, with all this talking going on, the lines between truth and fiction would blur, just like they do on the internet today. And that's when you can end up with a tall tale a story that mixes a bit of true with a bit of something else. As its name would suggest, there are a number of natural springs associated with Cave Springs, but there's only one spring that has a tall tail tied to it, and it's this spring here. Now, imagine it's a couple hundred years ago and you're passing through this area with a stomach ache. So you decide to get a drink from this spring. Now, back then it would have looked a lot different. Uh, there's some work being done on it now, and you can see there's a concrete reservoir that collects the water coming out of the ground through a series of pipes. Back then it would have just come out of the ground or the rocks here. So you get your drink and your stomach starts to feel better. Actually, it starts to feel a lot better. So you start talking to people about the medicinal qualities of the waters here at Cave Springs. And let's say that the people that you told your story to, they keep retelling it. And each time they do, it changes a little bit. Well, over the years, your story could evolve from being about the health benefits of the water here to somehow become associated with one of the oldest myths there is, the Fountain of Youth. And that does seem to be the progression of this story. I don't know how seriously that connection was ever taken, but it does show how your story about a stomach remedy can grow into a tall tale. And at the same time, it totally misses what was really happening here. And the first clue to that lies in the name of this spring. It's called the Magnesium Spring because rainwater would be captured by the rocks of the Niagara Escarpment about 50 meters above the spring. As it filtered through, the water would pick up the calcium and the magnesium in the rock. And when it exited at the spring below and you drank from it, the higher mineral content in the water, it could soothe your stomach or if you drank too much, be a very effective laxative. Now strangely, tests in recent years have shown that that mineral content has declined rather sharply and nobody's too sure why. And I should say that there is a sign here at the spring that says, don't drink the water. So please, don't drink the water. But just think back then, it's kind of hard now with all this apparatus here, but just think about having access to water with therapeutic abilities back then that may have been loosely associated with the Fountain of Youth. That would have been pretty powerful. That would have made this area seem special. And maybe even at times, magical. Imagine that somebody told you they had a place to keep food cold in the middle of July. Not a big deal to you and me today, but we're talking about 100 years ago. So that would have been something. And it would have seemed like science fiction, actually, because it's before household electricity and refrigeration. One trip to Cave Springs would change your mind, though. Watch this video, and then meet me down there when it's over. It's going to be 27 degrees Celsius this afternoon, but here in the ice cave, I'm seeing my breath. It doesn't get as cold as it used to, apparently. The ice doesn't form the way that it used to, but take it from me, it's still cold. That's right, I just said ice cave. It's right down there. It uh, actually had ice hanging from the ceiling in the middle of July, and people did use it to keep their food cold. It became so well known, actually, that in the 1846 Canadian Gazetteer, it got a bigger write-up than the nearby town of Beamsville. Let's take a closer look. The cave used to be much larger, but in the 1920s, a local farmer who saw all the people coming and going thought, hey, why not make it into a tourist attraction? But he wanted a larger entrance, so he decided to use some dynamite to open up the cave. That didn't work out so well. It had the opposite effect, actually. Most of the cave collapsed, and now there's just this one section that we can see. And it's true, it doesn't get as cold as it used to, but on certain days, like in that video that I showed you, there's no mistaking it. 
If you're up on the trail above, the cold just comes right up this hill and you know that you've found the ice cave. These are the Adam Steps. Nobody knows where they got their name from. I like to think it's a biblical reference to Adam because they're so old. But they form a natural stairway to the top of the escarpment, and we'll be going up there in a second because that's where they were. And what's waiting for us is actually more of a mystery than a tall tale because nobody knows who created them and nobody knows what happened to them. In 1948, Kenneth Kidd of the Royal Ontario Museum recorded two carvings of human heads cut into the rock at the top of the steps. He'd never seen any carvings quite like them before, so it made it hard to identify who may have created them. He did suggest, however, that they resembled smaller carvings done by the indigenous neutrals who had lived in the area until about 1650. I'd like to show the faces to you, but I can't. Years ago, they were either destroyed by vandals or taken by amateur collectors. There are some pictures of the faces while they were still here. Uh, this one is from Randy's book. It's not the clearest. It was taken by a kid in 1948. and kind of gives you an idea of what the face looked like. Uh, if I add some outlining, it makes it a little clearer, I think, but it's still not the best representation. If this was any place other than Cave Springs, this would have been the end of the story. Randy reported that one of the faces was actually found in a private collection in London, Ontario, unfortunately in pieces, but its whereabouts had been lost since the book's publication. So the best idea we have of what they really look like is this plaster cast by the late George Pepper of Niagara Falls. He donated it to the local history museum after he made it in 1953. It's about 20 centimeters tall, and you can see it was probably quite pronounced from the rock face, so it would have been very noticeable by anybody coming through here. And you have to think that people would have wondered whether it was decorative or whether it was ceremonial. It's a question we'll never have answered, but it would have added such a sense of history to this place and created a real mystique around it, I think. I almost forgot, there is another rock carving at Cave Springs. Um, it's right here, and people mistake it as indigenous at times, but it was actually created by a farmhand in the 1940s or 50s. First, the, the style is different, and this headdress is not something that the neutrals would ever have seen, so that's how you know it's not the real thing. And finally, kind of the ultimate tall tale of Cave Springs, at least for me. It starts in around 1900, late one night. Good start, right? A guy named Emerson Grob had a few too many at a local bar and decided to take a shortcut home up the escarpment, maybe on this very trail. As he progressed up the trail, he fell into one of the small caves that lined the area, passed out, and when he woke up in the morning, he found that the cave was filled with indigenous pottery. He was so excited by this find, he rushed home, hitched up his horses, and came back to Cave Springs. But this tale is called the Lost Cave for a reason. He didn't mark the location, and he could never find it again. And so now, this starts to sound like one of those fishing tales, but the one that got away? But it's not. Take a look. While Grob may have been lousy with directions, he did have the presence of mind that morning to take one of the artifacts with him. It was a clay vessel, likely made by the neutrals between 1350 and 1550 AD, and it is now in the collection of the Royal Ontario Museum. But that's not the end of this tale. It actually gets more mysterious. About 10 years later, a visitor shows up at Cave Springs, and walks straight into the forest, and seemingly with little difficulty finds Grob's cave. He doesn't tell anybody where it is, but he does walk back out with a handful of pottery, saying he's taking it to an American museum and that he'll be back for more. The thing is, he never came back. There are, of course, theories about who the visitor may have been, but there's no indication of how he knew exactly where the cave was or where the artifacts he took ended up. But like all the tales we've covered, there are just enough facts to the story, at least for me, to make it entirely entertaining and worthy of being remembered. And I think that's why it's important to keep these tales alive. They help us to see cave springs like those who came before us, as a ruggedly beautiful area whose truths were mixed with mystery and at times magic. But I want to dedicate this video to the late Margaret Reed. This was her house. It's not far from where the ice cave is. And it's where I interviewed her for my college paper many, many years ago. She was a fierce protector of this area, and if there's anything that she would want you to take away from this video, it's, well, 
First off, if you come here, please stay on the paths. It's a very delicate ecosystem. It needs to be protected. Don't drink the water. I already told you that. And don't go looking for Grob's Lost Cave. It's, people have searched for decades. It's never turned up. And finally, if you're walking through the forest and you find somebody who doesn't know the history here, tell them a tall tale or two. I really think Margaret would appreciate that.